everyone, today we're going to be going over the input debugger for the new input system. So it's a way to easily debug your input and see what values you're getting from your controls and your actions. So to start, make sure you have the input system installed. So go to Window Package Manager, then go to Unity Registry here and search for the input system and make sure you install that. We'll also be using for the samples a visualizer. So this will help you visualize your input. So if you'd like, you can download this as well to follow along. And so to go to the input debugger, we can go to window analysis, and then we can go to input debugger. And you can see that we have some options here. So let's quickly go over these options. So right here, it shows us the devices that are currently connected to our computer. So we have the keyboard, the mouse, and this is a simulated touchscreen. So this is the project I was working on for the touchscreen video. It simulates a touchscreen for us. And we're able to do this by going to options, simulate touch input from mouse or pen. So this is super useful if you're developing for mobile and you wanna test quickly, you can do so from the editor with your mouse. Unfortunately, if you need multiple fingers to test, this isn't the best option because you only have one mouse, so you'll have to build to your phone. And then here, here is a list of unsupported or unrecognized devices. So this is my keyboard and my mouse. However, we can just use these general ones and they will work the same. Then if we go under layouts, in the controls, you can see these are all the controls that are available in an input action. So let's just open up an input action here. You'll see that we have the action type, value button pass through and the control type. So these are all the control types that are available. And you can see that if you open one up, it tells you what they return. So this is super useful. For example, the vector two returns a vector two control. And you can see under controls for the vector two, it returns an X, which is an axis and a Y. And so for example, if you're not totally sure what the D-pad returns, you can open it up and you can see that it extends a vector two and that it returns these values down, left, right, and up or X and Y. All right, and for the abstract devices, these are the general devices that the input system supports. So you can see we have a gamepad, a mouse, a pen, PlayStation 4 controller, Xbox controller, and XR devices for VR or AR. And then you can open one up. So let's go to the mouse and you can see that the type and what it extends. You can also open up the controls and you can see all the controls for that device which is really useful. Then we have the more specific devices. For example, under game pads, we can open it up and it shows you a list of all the supported game pads. So the Android Xbox gamepad, PlayStation 4, iOS, Xbox One gamepad. I have no idea what that is, but these are just all the more specific devices it supports. Then here are the settings for your current input system. And you can see it has a dead zone, a default hold time, default tap time. If you want to change these, you can go to edit project settings, and then you can go to input system package. I already made one, but there will actually be a button that says make a new one, or you can go here and create a new settings asset. And you can just save this anywhere you want. And you can see that currently we're on that asset and we can change the settings here. So for example, if the default hold time is 0.4, we can change it to 0.6 and it'll update right here, which is pretty cool. And you can just change these settings as you want. You can also change the update mode. So whether you want the input to be processed in a normal update function or in the fixed update function, which is usually used for physics, or you can use a more manual approach. I definitely recommend using dynamic update because input is better suited for normal update because if you're doing it in fixed update, it runs at a slower frame rate than the normal update and you might miss some input from the user. And finally here we can add some supported devices. So you can narrow down the devices that you want to work with your game. So if you only want your game to work with a PlayStation 4 controller, you can just go to gamepad and add in a PlayStation 4 controller here. All right, and then back to the input debugger. Then we have some metrics down here that tells you the control count and the layout count and the size. Some other options here is that you can lock the input to the game view so it'll only return input if it's within this view. There's also this events diagnostic button, which I would suppose it gives you debug information every time an event happens for your input system. For example, if you press down on a button, it shoots out the pressed down event or started event. But unfortunately, at least with my version, which is 2020.1, it just throws a bunch of errors. And there's absolutely no documentation for this anywhere. So I'm just gonna disable it. But there's still a lot of useful things about the input debugger that I have yet to show. This lets you get input from the unsupported devices if it doesn't recognize it. And lastly, as I mentioned before, 
This is useful if you're developing for mobile, if you want to simulate the touch in the editor. All right, so let's actually open up one of these devices. So if we go to mouse and double click it, this will pop up. And this is super useful because this tells you all of the actions that the mouse has. The back button, the click count, the delta, which is how much it travels between the previous and the current frame. It has all of its properties here, the current position, and you see that it's updating real time, which is super useful for debugging input. So if I'm pressing down right now, you'll see that press is one. If you're not sure that something's working, for example, you're clicking a button, but nothing's happening, then you can go in here and check if it's actually registering that button. And if it is, then you'll probably reckon that something's wrong with your logic. So this is also useful for knowing what's available in the current action. So let's say I wanted to get the position, but I wasn't exactly sure what it would return. So here it would return a vector two, and it will also return in that vector two, I can get the X and the Y. And so then in this input action, I can change to a vector two here, and then I know that this will return an X and a Y. These are just the events of the mouse. So every time I move, you see that it's adding a new event. We can also clear here. We can also pause it and then clear so it doesn't actually register any events for this control. And what's cool is that you can actually record the input for a short time with this record frames. However, I'm going to be switching to a keyboard for this so it's easier to tell what's going on. So right here I'm pressing the numbers. You'll see I'm pressing one, two, three, four. Make sure when you press record frames that pause isn't pressed or else it will, you know, be paused. The input will be paused and you won't actually be able to record anything. So let's press record. We press one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then we can actually save this here, save. And we can uncheck the record frames. So let's just load one here. You'll see that if we scroll down, it'll show you when we press a specific key. So right here I pressed five. And it actually changes it here, but it's a little fast to see sometimes. And this is a little finicky, especially with the pause and the record frames. So you can just play around with it and see what works for you best. But you can click on one of these, for example, the stat one, and you can see more information about all the keys on the keyboard here and which ones are currently being pressed. So five is currently being pressed and any key is being pressed. And then you can also click the state, which this one displays the current state of the device, but this does not update real time. So this is kind of like a snapshot of your input data and you can take the time to inspect it as you need it. All right, so pretty cool so far, right? There's actually another feature in remote devices here. You can actually do all of this, but with a remote device. So right now it's connected to the editor, but let's say you have your phone connected. So we can go into file build settings and currently it's fetching our connected devices and you'll see that my phone is connected to my computer. And so currently nothing's happening because I actually have to run the app on the phone. So make sure you actually build it to your phone and run it. And now you'll see that it'll show up here. So this is my LGE. And if I just click it, you'll see that now I have my local device, which is this editor. And then I have my remote device here, which is the Android player. And you can see that we have a bunch of stuff here. So we can actually go to the touch screen one, double click that. And now you'll see that I'm moving my finger across the screen and now I stopped it. But you can see that the position is updating in real time, which is so cool. You can see that touch zero is the first finger. So you can see I'm moving it around. And if we go down to touch one, we have to have two fingers on the screen for this one. And you'll see that the positions are being updated because I have two fingers on the screen. Something that I didn't mention that I thought was really cool is that once you're in the remote devices, you can go to your console and actually connect it to your LGE. And you'll see that now all my debug logs are getting printed. So I'm swiping down and it's printing swiping down. And if I swipe to the left, you'll see that now it's printing out my debug.log. So this is super useful for debugging as well. Awesome. So there's another thing which I mentioned briefly under the package manager. I actually installed the visualizers here, which is a great package to actually visualize your input. So go to assets. Once you have that downloaded samples, input system, the version visualizers, and then we have several scenes here. So we have a gamepad visualizer, a mouse visualizer, pen visualizer and a simple controls visualizer. So if we go to the gamepad one and we connect a gamepad to our computer, Unity will register it. And you'll see that now I can move my thumbstick around and it moves it in the same exact way on the Unity scene, which is so cool. You can see I'm pressing the left and right triggers and it's green. You can see the sensitivity of them as well. 
So this is also great for if you have actions that require sensitive input and you're not sure what threshold you can use, you can kind of test around here and see which one best fits you. Right and left shoulder, all the buttons are clicking, the d-pad works as well, and it's just really cool and really well made. And I'm actually zoomed in, but you can zoom out to see the whole scene. And you can do this with the mouse one as well. So if we go to the mouse one, I'm moving the mouse and it's drawing the motions on this graph here. And now I'm clicking the buttons. And then we have some extra scenes here. So this is a simple controls visualizer. So right now I'm just moving the mouse around and pressing the WASD keys. This is actually an input action that they have over here, simple controls. So you can actually input your own. Under player, you can just input your own actions and you select your default map. And I'm just gonna show you how to do it with the existing simple controls. So if you wanted to add in another action, for example, let's add in a grab action here Let's make it an action type of button. And then for the binding, we can just press listen and I'm just gonna select E. And then I'm gonna save the asset. And you can see that they have a fire action visualizer here. So they have one for value. And since they also have an interaction, they have an interaction visualization as well. But since we only have a value, we can just duplicate that with control D. And I can just rename that to use grab. And instead of the label, which is what the text says, you can just put grab here. And you can change the position with the rect. So I can drag it over here. And then I have to make sure that the action name here matches what I put in the input action asset. So grab. And then when I press play and I press E, you'll see that it has keyboard E and it's pressed one right now. So that's just a cool way to make sure that your inputs are doing what you expect them to. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you'll consider using the input debugger if you haven't because it's super useful for helping you know what your actions are and what input you're currently getting. I'd like to thank my patrons for all their support. Y'all are amazing. Thank you so much. I got so many views on my Patreon video and I really appreciate all of the support that I've gotten. It really helps me make these videos. And so I'd like to thank my new patrons in the supporter tier. In the enthusiastic tier, we have Colin Leister, Justin, Boscaiolo and Paul Haynes. And I apologize in advance if I pronounce some of these names incorrectly. And in the dedicated tier, we have Lamora A Journey in Time, Mans, and Martin Admire. Thank you all for your support. I really appreciate it. Your support goes a long way in helping me make these kind of videos. So thank you. And if you're interested in becoming a patron, which would be awesome, the link is in the description. I offer source code, early access for videos, and an exclusive Discord channel. And if you haven't already, be sure to join our Discord channel where you can chat, post memes, or ask for help. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and see you next time.